Hey everybody, this is Kodak here, and I may have lied about the end of the Disney-thon because, as it turns out, for my very first ever Patreon-supported review, Lord Gamermon has asked me to do a retrospective of Disney Infinity. Now, if my discussion on Disney Infinity seemed a tad glib in my Fate of Toys to Life video, link in the description, it's because, I admit, I didn't play Infinities 2 and 3 all that much. Fortunately, all of the parts needed to go over everything are super cheap thanks to the crash of the genre, so it was no big deal to get everything together. So, with that said, let's take a look at the rise and fall of Disney Infinity. Created by Avalanche Studios in 2013, Disney Infinity was put out as the first real competition aimed at the hugely successful Skylanders franchise created by Activision Blizzard. At this point, the Toys to Life boom was still going strong, with Skylanders entering its third year still on top of the heap, with various connected toys trying and failing to match its success. Disney Infinity's announcement got a mixed response, with some noticing how it obviously chases the success of Skylanders, and others noting the potential of a Skylanders-like game made using beloved Disney characters and featuring that Disney polish that people have come to expect. Infinity launched in August 2013 in competition with Skylanders Swap Force, and boy did they monetize the heck out of it. Not only did they put out additional figures and level packs, but they also put out collector discs along with albums and cases to hold them in, carrying bags, display cases, and most pathetically of all, an extension cord for their version of the Portal of Power. Yeah, this... this was just sad. I mean, yeah, Skylanders was heavily monetized with carrying cases and things like this, but not as heavily as Disney Infinity was. At least not at that point. But of course we gotta start somewhere, and that brings us to the Disney Infinity 1.0 Starter Pack. Reminiscent of Skylanders, the Disney Infinity Starter Pack costs $75 and comes with three characters, a power pad, and a cube-shaped toy box piece. The power pad is different from the Skylanders Portal of Power in several ways. Rather than a single large base, there are instead several spaces onto which you put the game pieces two round pieces to attach the character plates, and a diamond shape onto which go the playsets. Yeah, one thing that Disney Infinity presses is that all of the actions that happen in this game are being done with toys or playsets rather than the actual characters. I guess it's in order to excuse all of the crazy violence that can happen in this game where you can punch Jim Cummings into a pile of jibs that go flying a considerable distance. It's a bit of a weak narrative device to permit the different characters to interact and cross over. I mean, it's the same one Smash Brothers uses for crying out loud. But during its production, this game was referred to as Disney Toy Box, so I guess it's more an artifact of the creative process. Still, it doesn't quite have the punch of claiming that the toys are literally the shrunken heroes and that by putting them on the device, you're sending those heroes home. There are also collectibles called Power Discs that were sold in blind bags and could do a number of things, such as spawn a special item, or change the skybox or terrain, or even provide power-ups and special abilities to player characters by being neatly stacked underneath the figures. Now, something that was actually kind of fun about the ones that altered how the terrain looked is that when you were connected to a friend's toy box while they were working on it, you could actually plug in one of these discs and alter everything they've just done. It's actually a pretty unique form of griefing. As for the diamond slot, there are two ways to play the game. You can either leave this spot empty in order to play in toy box mode, or you can plunk down one of the special pieces in order to play in playset mode. And here's where some interesting things take place, because a lot of the designs in Disney Infinity seemed to be there specifically to deal with some of the problems that Skylanders was having. One of the big hooks that Skylanders used to draw in players was to allow you to place a boxed characters on an in-store display to trigger a preview video. This not only lets you preview the game and see how the character behaves in said game, but also lets you play with your character at home without having to remove them from their packaging. Which is something that I, as the owner of a Chase variant figure, deeply appreciate. Of course, this also brought some problems. A particularly exploitative person might buy the figure, go home, swipe it on their portal to receive credit for owning the figure, and then take the box figure back to the store to return it for a full refund. Also, the level packs, which are sold at a higher price, only need to be tapped onto the Portal of Power once in order to unlock that level permanently, meaning that these figures can be passed around to as many people as possible to unlock all of that paid content essentially for free. 
In response to this, Disney enforced an aspect of permanence in their game. Characters must be unboxed, and things such as discs and playsets must remain on the portal if you want to continue to play inside of them, which makes passing them around at least a whole lot harder. Now, a quick aside before we really dive in, it's worth noting that while Activision did eventually do some things similar to Disney Infinity where you must keep the piece in place at all times, the traps and trap team for example, it's worth noting that they actually didn't change a lot of the things that were causing them some problems, and it might be worth considering why they didn't do that. For example, still being able to play with the characters in the box and passing around the level packs, but that's a video for another time, so for now, let us dive into the one thing that unifies all three Disney Infinity games, the Toy Box. The Toy Box is the Minecraft element that Disney threw into their game, a level editor and open play world that lets you create your very own Disneyland. The way the Toy Box is introduced in the first game is actually pretty clever. After a very trippy opening that gives you a feel for how the game will play out, you get dropped in a pretty snazzy, pre-built world. It's got a castle in the middle, a few enemies to beat up, a racetrack that you can find with a little exploration, and the ability to mess around with absolutely everything. You can move the castle, you can build a staircase, you can even conjure up a better car! Well, maybe not right away, but eventually. You don't start the game with a lot of options as far as special pieces are concerned. This is something I really enjoy about Disney Infinity, and that is that sense of slowly expanding scope. And keep that idea in mind, as it is part of the reason why Disney Infinity 1.0 is so good. In the original Disney Infinity, Avalanche clearly understood the importance of not front-loading their mechanics, and it spans across every part of the game. Getting back to the toy box, you start with very few pieces to put down, but you can unlock new ones as you go by using spins on a roulette table. You can get spins by finding them in the starter toy box or in the play sets, by leveling up characters, performing feats, or by exploiting an infinitely respawning spin token in the racing area, although that last one has been patched out. Yeah. So not only do you unlock the new parts, terrain, set pieces, and objects slowly over time, but the starting toy box gives you a great place to experiment with these items as you get them to see how they work. Eventually, you also start getting trigger plates and other special pieces that let you program interactions and develop more complex creations. But since all of this fluff isn't front-loaded onto you, you can slowly get a feel for how everything interacts and works. And the system is surprisingly flexible. I've done quite a few things with my toy box designs. I've made a Cave of Wonders, recreated Rainbow Road, and of course made my own version of Disneyland. There was also a regular assortment of maps and toy boxes available for download at any given time through their online service. Of course, the system has its limitations. There is a restriction on how many objects you can place, especially on the Wii version, and the racing tracks can be tricky to assemble correctly in a way that actually fills out a track. That and the roulette unlocks only so many items that you can play with. In order to get the rest, you have to delve into the playsets. The playsets are the big attractions of Disney Infinity, each of them based on a different Disney franchise, with each playset being developed by a different video game studio in order to generate a unique experience within them. Unlike the linear, level-based gameplay from Skylanders, the playsets in Disney Infinity are all open-world campaigns full of missions and exploration where characters can buy new items and vehicles through a form of currency that's unique to each stage in order to purchase the buildings and equipment needed to advance the story, while simultaneously unlocking content for use in the toy box. There are three of these playsets included in the starter set, Monsters University, Pirates of the Caribbean, and The Incredibles. This is what sort of prompted my whole actually Pixar and movie starting Johnny Depp Infinity joke back in 2013. Anyway, each of the playsets has a roughly six hour campaign each, and each one has a very different feel. Monsters University has a very lighthearted approach full of campus hijinks, paintball, and pranks. The Incredibles has the Par family saving the day from an endless onslaught of Syndrome's robots, and I mean endless. And finally, Pirates of the Caribbean, where you Jack Sparrow, Jack Sparrow, Jack Sparrow, Jack Sparrow! Jack Sparrow! <clears throat> I mean, where you explore an island archipelago as pirate Captain Jack Sparrow. Something all of these playsets have in common is that you make progress by completing small quests, whether it be by helping people, occasionally by chucking them into the ocean, defeating enemies, or some other puzzle. This earns you experience and currency, which can be used to buy the items you need to progress. As far as the actual games go, they are pretty engaging, but... I can't help but feel like they're sort of those 
cash-in, cobbled-together games that you get when a new movie comes out. They are kind of rough around the edges, with one exception. I actually find the Pirates of the Caribbean playset to be the most fun out of those that come in the starter set. There is a huge emphasis on exploration and all sorts of different things to do, whether it be platforming around an island, moving a rowboat through a precarious bog, or getting into a fight on the high seas. The way the game moves with its slowly expanding goals, from buying a ship to get off the first island, to managing to approach and sneak around the marine headquarters, to finally taking down Davy Jones to save the Seven Seas, is actually really fun and engaging. The weakest one, I think, is actually The Incredibles, which I know was a favorite for a lot of folks, but the entire game has so much running around fighting robots that you don't really get a feel for how the city is laid out except for the area around your home base, and that's because you're constantly modifying it. It doesn't help that the game is constantly raining the most powerful and difficult enemies in all of Disney Infinity onto you when all you're trying to do is explore. Then again, it is the only one of the three toy boxes to employ deeper combat mechanics, and it is very easy to traverse the map, so it does have some things going for it. Which leaves Monsters University as the middle-of-the-road option. I will admit, it is a bit dull with its emphasis on committing pranks in frat life rather than using the industrial setting of the movie that made the universe famous. However, it does have plenty of differences in kind by including bike stunts, paintball tournaments, and even some interesting sneaking sections towards the end where you try to pull off the ultimate prank. And then there are the level packs. For $30, you get a set of two characters plus a new piece that unlocks one new playset. The fact that each of these sets come with two characters resolves one issue of the starter. Since characters can only go into the playsets of their own universe, the base set does not support co-op play in its base form, and one would have to purchase another character in order to enjoy it with two players. The three additional playsets are Lone Ranger, Cars, and Toy Story in Space. In case the use of Monsters University wasn't obvious enough, Disney Infinity was also used as a vehicle to promote Disney's newer movies, in this case also including Lone Ranger, as both movies came out that year. Back to back, in fact. Starting with the Lone Ranger, this game involves first saving a small town from a bandit invasion before fixing up a train in order to take on the bandits hiding in the silver mines at the other end of the canyon. Toy Story in Space is actually a lot different from what you might be thinking. Instead of a Toy Story romp in Andy's room, you are instead having a more Space Ranger-like adventure where you work to secure a space colony on a distant planet while riding around as a cowboy on a plush horse. The Cars level is unique in that you spend the entire world literally as a vehicle. Honestly, playing as a vehicle 100% of the time in an open-world game with those familiar vehicle controls really is a new one. I can't help but wonder, what would the Grand Theft Auto games be called in the Cars universe? Kidnapped? Kidnapped Vice City? One thing I love about the playsets is, again, you get the feeling of a slowly expanding world. Buying your first ship in order to escape the starting island on Pirates, fixing each stage of track in Lone Ranger, and going from the campus to Frat Row to Scare Tech in Monsters University, each playset is careful to avoid overwhelming the player at first and gives you hints of new areas to explore, making you anticipate when a new space becomes available to you. Lone Ranger and Cars in particular have vast areas to explore thanks to their themes of fast travel, either by horse or by person car. Either way, they're fun little time wasters, nothing more and nothing less. They did still have their fair share of problems, however. A common point of complaint was that leveling up your character didn't actually mean anything beyond unlocking additional spins in the toy box, and the tool and pack system, where every character can use every item, meant that the characters didn't really stand out from one another. There were also the toy box only characters such as Agent P and Elsa, who cannot be used in any of the playsets and thus are only usable in the toy box. It feels like an opportunity was missed when they don't allow the characters to cross over into different playsets, even if it was as a story completion reward. But Disney Infinity still did really well, breaking well over 3 million starters sold and raking in over half a billion dollars. People showed up for power disc swapping events, characters sold out, and a lot of the original characters have retained their value. Really makes me wish I hadn't damaged my Violet figure. Sheesh. And it was on this solid foundation of hype that Disney moved into Infinity 2.0, waggling around their hot Marvel brand that was still going strong on the Avengers and the thankful success of Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 1. 
The release of 2.0 was sort of split in half between the Marvel Super Heroes line and the Disney Originals, consisting of two different starter sets. One for the Marvel Super Heroes that include half of the Avengers and the Avengers playset, and another for the Toy Box Unique characters, in this case called Disney Originals, which come with two characters and two Toy Box games for a lower price point. Since both games contain compatible figures, they supported co-op play right out of the box. There are quite a number of changes made between these two games, the most obvious of which are the addition of talent trees to each character, allowing you to power up their movesets and customize their abilities. This was done obviously in response to people's big complaints that leveling up in Disney Infinity didn't really mean much, and yeah, it really didn't. It was kind of a half-baked Skylanders imitation, and what Disney needed to do was either throw it away or lean into it, and in this case they leaned into it, which I honestly think was the right decision, because as a result of this, every character now feels unique and special. On each of these talent trees, each character also gains some special abilities that affect how they can move around the level. They might get super strength, or a high jump, wall crawling, tech specialty, and one that completely breaks the game. Yeah, there's no beating around the bush. The flight special ability, as cool as it is, sort of ruins the fun of the game. The ability to fly freely in a game is always a difficult thing to work with, especially in an adventure platformer. It needs to either be severely limited or something unlocked late in the game, but in the case of pack-in characters Thor and Iron Man, they can fly from the very beginning, making navigating the Avengers Tower playset, where you must fight off a frost giant invasion that is slowly freezing New York City, a bit too easy. I mean, it's cool to be able to fly around New York and see all the major landmarks, but at the same time, it makes it impossible to appreciate any sort of platforming layout that the designers came up with. Remember the theme of a slowly unfolding world in the original Disney Infinity? Yeah, when you can fly anywhere, that doesn't really happen since you can reach just about everything at the start. This has the effect of making the setting feel really unmemorable since I don't have to master navigation and get into every nook and cranny. It's just traveling from point A to point B without anything interesting in between. I mean, with how fast you can fly, why would I ever bother with a walking character? Also remove the playset specific currencies that let you buy the new parts and buildings, and instead the sparks you obtain are used to buy items for the toy box, with new vehicles and items being obtained through regular gameplay instead. Not to mention, for being the only campaign in the starter, it's a far cry from the three six hour campaigns you get in Disney Infinity 1.0, and honestly, it's not even a match for one of those. I beat the Avengers level in four hours. Yeah, all of the campaigns, all three of them, seem to be shorter than the last game. They also have a much heavier focus on combat, and two of them take place in New York. Yeah, there is a palpable loss of variety in these playsets, and the only one that seems to come close to embracing the fun of exploration from the first game is Guardians of the Galaxy, mainly because nobody on the team can fly. This means that you have to navigate the world another way, mainly by using Star-Lord's high jump. I mean, you can collect the crossover coins that let the flying characters Iron Man and Nova able to play, but that idea is for chumps. That and their crossover coins, which you have to collect to let them in, are mostly locked away for a pretty good chunk of the gameplay. On the flip side, the Disney originals were actually given a lot more to do in the form of the toy box games. Four of these games were released, two of which come in the Disney original starter, and they act as sort of slimmed down playsets created entirely within the revamped toy box engine. I was able to get my hands on the two pack-in toy box games, the Brave game, which is an exploration adventure game, and the Lilo and Stitch game, which is a tower defense game. I actually really like these toy box games. You can kind of see how things work under the hood if you pay attention, and it finally gives the toy box only characters something to finally do. And yes, you can bring any original into either toy box game, meaning you can use Merida's totally broken ranged attack in the tower defense game. On the other hand, they are awfully repetitive. I mean, come on, one of them is tower defense, and they also represent a huge missed opportunity. You see, aside from being able to unlock the toy box pieces from the previous game, not a single figure or playset from the first game really works in the second one. At least, not outside of the toy box. I see this as a missed opportunity because it was a chance to expand upon the characters and their stories. 
I mean, Cars has sequels, Monsters University has a chronological sequel, The Incredibles has a sequel, though I guess they didn't have it at the time, but Pirates has sequels, Toy Story has sequels, so many of these movies could have been expanded upon and given new stories using these sorts of toy box games. And why didn't they make one of these toy box games for Frozen? Are they insane? I mean, I guess it might have been redundant having two games where the world freezes over, but that sure didn't stop them from putting two of the playsets in New York. However, one thing that was made considerably more robust was the toy box. In addition to everything from the first game, which you sadly have to repurchase most of, there were a lot of new items including the ability to make a proper Agrabah and a lot more switches and objects that allow players to produce an interactive game like those found in the toy box games. I'm messing around with an Agrabah game right now, but it's a shame that I won't be able to share it online since everything is tied up so tightly. That's kind of an ongoing problem with the toy box is that it's difficult to share your creations with others and people can't really discover what you've done. Has anybody come up with a good way to like dump the information somewhere for people to find? Now, moving into 3.0, Disney Infinity was actually in a bit of trouble. You see, the whirlwind success of the first game meant that most of the figures were perpetually sold out and difficult to find. To account for this, Disney compensated in a big way on 2.0, but managed to overreach itself, printing twice as many figures as they could actually sell, and a lot of the figures that they introduced wound up being duds, such as Yondu, Aladdin, and the Green Goblin. I mean, I guess Guardians Volume 2 didn't come out fast enough to make Yondu viable, but the massive overstock of figures that Disney had been producing directly had caused a considerable financial strain. Compared to the streamlined, fairly cheap Skylanders figures, the Disney Infinity figures were of considerably higher quality and didn't produce the same profit margins that Skylanders, even with lukewarm sales, was able to. So even though they were still one of the top contenders in the Toys to Life business, Disney Infinity was still sweating pretty heavily going into 2015, now competing with not only Skylanders Superchargers, but also the brand new game Lego Dimensions, which had all of that infinite universe crossover potential that Disney Infinity really hadn't capitalized on. So, in order to compete with these new brands, Disney Infinity reached into one of Disney's latest acquisitions that was about to come back in a big way. Yep, to tie in with the launch of Star Wars The Force Awakens, Disney Infinity 3.0 launched with a Star Wars theme with three Star Wars playsets, essentially one per trilogy, along with some Star Wars Rebel characters. The playsets are similar to those found in the Marvel sets from 2.0, heavy on combat with a starting area followed by the opening of a larger outside area for players to explore. They also brought back some of the toy box games in a new form, making a setting for the Marvel Civil War to follow up on the Marvel characters, as well as playsets for the new Pixar films Inside Out and Finding Dory, with Moana planned for the final set of the game. The crossover coins returned for the Star Wars playsets, allowing some characters to jump through time to appear in different settings, and the Jedi characters got some neat tricks at their disposal. Oh dear, a factory level. We should be careful going through here. Or we can just skip it with our awesome Jedi powers! <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, oh, totally yeah, oh man, this is awesome, oh, yeah, oh, yes, the air. And it did pretty well. Like, basically everything Star Wars that year, Disney Infinity actually sold like hotcakes with a lot of people really liking how the Disney Infinity design was applied to their favorite Star Wars characters, raking in about $200 million. But even despite that, it wasn't enough to keep the project going, and thus, in May 2016, Disney not only suddenly ended the project, but shuttered both Avalanche Studios and even Disney Interactive Studios itself, opting to stick to licensing its properties rather than developing them in-house. The reason? Disney Infinity wasn't making enough money. Now, I know that sounds insane. Even though they were the second best in the genre, they still were not making enough money? Hear me out. This statement was true, and it all comes down to how the games were managed. Disney Infinity's development was not done by Avalanche alone. Unlike Skylanders, which was a joint project of two studios, Vicarious Visions and Toys for Bob, who essentially took turns releasing games in order to have a healthy two-year development cycle on each one, Disney Infinity was made by no fewer than six different studios at a time, each getting a one-year development cycle. And that amount of work doesn't come cheap. Combine this with Disney being overprotective of their IPs, and shareholders making strict demands of the studios involved, and we have one mess of a production. And all of those combined meant that the easy second banana in all of Toys to Life was still losing money, weighed down by the sheer bloat of its production budget. You see? 
This is why we can't have nice things. Still, it was a bit of a bad move to drop this announcement not only out of the blue, but before everything was released. Several of the figures, along with the Moana level pack, were never put out, and the plans for Infinity 4.0 were also scrapped. Which is a shame, because from what I heard, 4.0 would have been a wonderful last hurrah that addressed a lot of the problems I and many had with the previous games. Prior storylines would have been extended, new versions of the old characters would have come out, and there would have finally been a total crossover story that allows all of the characters to mingle in an ongoing campaign. We could have had Elsa on Tatooine, Mr. Incredible could have fought pirates on the open seas, Darth Vader could have gone racing against Dory! But sadly, it's a coulda, woulda, shoulda situation. Now, another reason that Disney cited for canceling Infinity was that they didn't see any future in Toys to Life, and let's face it, they were pretty much right about that. But that provokes some fun speculation. What would have happened if they had allowed 3.0 to at least run its course or ended things properly with 4.0? Did Infinity's sudden and shocking departure shake the market so much that it actually killed off Toys to Life faster? Or did Disney call it like they saw it and actually pull that at the right time? You guys tell me what you think in the comments, because frankly this video has already gone on for 10 pages and I think that's a bit much for a Patreon sponsored review. Anyways, thank you very much Lord Gamermon for sponsoring this video and requesting this topic. In the future I hope to do more videos like this. I have some spots available on my Patreon if you guys want to take a look at that. And uh, that's a look at Disney Infinity. And if you guys want to see more videos like this, consider supporting me on Patreon. My $50 a month milestone, just $50 a month. I am so close to it. But if you guys can get me that far, I will make a video about each of the Pokemon movies, reviewing every single one that has come out so far. So please consider giving my Patreon page a look. And until next time, this is Kodak signing off.